and good evening friends welcome to yet another episode of acns webinars today we have with us two stalwarts of neurosurgery who are going to teach us about the respective subspecialties the first speaker for today is no stranger to us is one of the leading vascular surgeons in the world and who also has been instrumental in imparting wisdom to young neurosurgeons through his educational lectures ladies and gentlemen it's my great honor to introduce you to the man who is a powerhouse of energy and tremendous talent in bypass surgery professor katsumita kizawa Professor Takizawa is the professor and head of department of Asahi Kawa Red Cross Hospital, Hokkaido, Japan. Professor Takizawa became a very familiar name to us in India when he shot to fame as one of the main surgeons involved in the separation of the cranioferous twins, during which he reconstructed the entire supraspinal sinus and six bridging veins attached to it successfully. It was my great honor to watch him live during my fellowship days in Bantani, Japan, where we he used to come to operate and teach us patiently and made. sure that we understood the logic behind every step professor takizawa has been instrumental in supporting the educational conferences and workshops of acns from a very long time professor takizawa is going to talk about how to troubleshoot a failed bypass surgery today or in another words recovery techniques from unexpected troubles in bypass surgery we are extremely honored and thankful to professor takizawa for accepting our invitation to be speaker at our webinars The second speaker for today is our learned guest from China, Professor Feng Hailong. Professor Hailong is a professor and head of the Department of Neurosurgery, Chengdu West Hospital, Sichuan, China. He is a member of the Neurospine Academic Committee, Chinese Research Hospital Association, Vice Neurospine Committee. We are indeed so thankful to him to have accepted this invitation and speak to us at our webinars. The chair for today's webinar is our learned professor Christian Rafter Paulus from Brussels, Belgium. Professor Dr. Paulus is a professor and head of the Department of Neurosurgery, Saint Luke University Hospital, Brussels, Belgium. Professor Dr. Paulus's scientific contributions include the development of a new classification of intracranial pressure waves and development of modified surgical techniques for TRM malformation, meningocele, and intracranial aneurysms. Currently, Professor Dr. Paulus is particularly involved in epilepsy surgery and new minimally invasive spinal techniques. His considerable work is reflected in more than 100 articles which he is the author and co-author and have published in peer review journals. He was the past general secretary and the president of the French language neurosurgery society also known as Société de Neurochirurgie de Langue Française. We are extremely honored today to have him with us to chair this webinar. On behalf of the education committee of the ACNS and the president Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to sincerely welcome today's speakers Professor Katsumi Takizawa. and professor feng hailong as well as the chair for today professor christian rafter paulus to this online platform of acns webinars dr liu bun singh from malaysia is my co-host for today with that introduction may i please hand over the platform to professor rafter paulus very kind of you for this introduction it's a great pleasure to be among you of course and uh, as i'm very eager to listen today or to uh, lecturers uh, especially with uh, a very attractive title as recovery technique from unexpected uh, troubles uh, we know all of us that bypass surgery is not a easy procedure needs to develop uh, skills and uh, i'm very interesting and eager to listen my colleague professor takisawa to speak about his experience dealing with unexpected troubles so I give you uh, I give him the floor. Okay, thank you professor. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm very happy to have this opportunity. Today I'd like to talking about the technical aspect mainly technical aspect of the bypass surgery. And I prepare this presentation for young neurosurgeon they want to master bypass surgery. I think today's presentation will be useful for your tomorrow surgeries. Okay, bypass surgery is useful techniques, not only for ischemic disease like this uh, hemodynamic compromised patient, but also for also complex um, cerebral aneurysm, uh, complex brain tumor needing uh, revascularization techniques. Uh, for bypass surgery, most important thing is long-term patency of bypass graft and perform the bypass without complication, no complications. 
Okay, so I'd like to mention about how to master bypass surgeries. Okay, continuous of the job microanosmosis training is essential to master the bypass techniques. Okay, you should uh, practice as much as possible. Maybe uh, continue forever, I think. Okay, this is a photograph, a training photograph of my fellows. Okay, this is a uh, first times. Okay, they perform the uh, bypass uh, their own postures. Okay, but after my advices, their posture changed. Good postures. Okay, uh, every surgery uh, posture is important for good uh, result, including bypass. Okay, posture is uh, very important. But uh, for the success of bypass surgery, only microanosmos training is not enough. Okay, we should learn many tips and tricks from the actual surgery, such as fundamental theory and techniques or recovery techniques. Okay, but uh, in my opinion, most important is avoiding troubles. Okay, keep in mind, avoiding troubles. Okay, this is uh, incomplete um, preparation videos um, performed by uh, my fellows. Okay, he practiced um, every day, um, many, many uh, performed practice, but uh, not so many experience of actual surgeries. Okay, now he starts the bypass, um, put the temporary clips here. I'm sorry. Okay, now start the uh, anastomosis. He put a temporary clip here. But I said to him, stop the anastomosis. He released the temporary crypt, uh, check the uh, surgical field again. Okay, what is incomplete uh, this uh, preparations? Okay. Okay, I check the uh, surgical field. Okay, firstly, uh, cottonoid has uh, small fibers. Okay, if uh, leave the cottonoid uh, surgical field, this fiber disturbs the, uh, uh, and catch the, the needles. Okay, so don't leave the cottonoid surgical field. Okay, so take off. Okay, also um, the hemostasis is not complete, incomplete, is incomplete. Okay, meticulous hemostasis is essential for the bypass surgeries. Also to avoid an uh, accident uh, to cover the brain surface okay, by gel foam, okay, not cottonite. Okay, also he puts the temporary clip here. Okay, so this length is not enough for the anastomosis. Okay, so uh, we should uh, uh, check the aleatotomy length again. Okay, from here to here. So we should cut arachnoid and expose the recipient more. Okay, you can see the small branch here and here. Okay, so broke the small branch by small temporary clips. So 
also perform the bypass and block, not here, okay, here to here. Okay, put temporary clip is here. Okay, now the preparation is complete. Okay, so again, he started the bypass. Put temporary clips. Okay, his anastomosis technique is very good because he practiced many, many times. Okay, he can use both hands his hand is very stable. Okay, but he has not so many experience of actual surgeries. Okay, this is the final view. Very nice anastomosis. Okay, for the uh, success of anastomosis, okay, not only uh, enough, uh, but uh, we should master many things from the actual surgeries. Okay. Okay, this is the preparation of the recipient arteries. Okay, big one is better. So cut arachnoid. Yeah, but they usually have a small branches like this. Okay. Some branch acceptable um, sacrifice, coagulation and cut. Okay, but if possible, preserve the uh, small branch is better. Here is another branch here. So I preserve these small branches. Okay, first it blocks the small branch using small temporary clips. Then start anastomosis. Put temporary clips. Now confirm the uh, complete occlusions make arteriostomy. Okay, but this clip is not complete. Okay, come uh, some flaws. In that case is um, one way change the clips or put additional clips okay but uh, just change the position okay if the flow is not so too much just uh, change the position of the clips okay now block the flow completely okay this is a, a small techniques to block the flow. Okay, complete block is essential for the good anastomosis. Okay, also this uh, theoretical aspect of the how to make anastomosis. Okay, this is very important. Okay, um, bite uh, position and the interval of sutures and reverting techniques. Okay, this is the uh, uh, most essential techniques for the good bypass. Okay, also all sutures should be performed properly. Okay, also uh, fish mouth trimmings and match arterial length uh, completely with the donor artery is also essential. Okay, for example, now perform uh, fish mouth trimmings.
Still, depending on the vessel size, sometimes cut uh, this corner for the smooth curves. Okay, bio today is also essential to confirm the intima of the vessel edge. Okay, com completely match. Okay, arteriomy length and the uh, donor length. Okay, if uh, match the this length completely. Okay, easy to suture by everything. Okay, only one actions. Okay, easy to suture. Uh, also, this is everything. This is the final views. Okay, this case, arteriotomy length is too long. Okay, this length is too long. This leads to uh, some problems. Okay, now broken the control lateral state switches. Okay, no, it is not good. Also, this case is uh, arteriotomy is slightly short. So hidden the recipient by uh, donor arteries. So it is difficult to make a, a suture by averting techniques. So too much, the length of the arteriotomy and the recipient is very important. Also, this is a, a technique how to remove the appropriate sutures. Okay, confirm the lumen. and bite the recipient. But this suture, we can't confirm the room, lumen of the recipient. So uh, this suture bite both walls. Now resolve the uh, suture, but not complete, maybe. But uh, I didn't notice this times. Uh, continue the suture. This suture is no problem. Also, this suture is not good because we can't confirm the inside the lumens.
Can after finish the anastomosis, now confirm the patency by ICG. Okay, we can see the defect of the ICG here. So block again the MCA and remove the inappropriate suture. Okay, catch the thread and only cut the knot. So we can take off the suture without no damage of the vessels. He cuts and pull and cut the knot. He cuts the suture and pull and only cut the knot and take off. Okay, no damage of the vessels. Okay, again, I confirm the lumen. Okay, now it's good. Then suture again. If the uh, time to until recovery is short, just take off the suture and this suture is enough. Okay, now open the temporary clips. Okay, widely expand. Okay, check ICG now. Okay, now is a good flow. You can see the good holes here. Okay, so when remove the uh, inappropriate sutures, you okay, can catch the uh, resting thread and pull and only cut the knot. Okay, so if cut the uh, this needle too short, it okay, looks very beautiful. But if we should take one sutures, it is difficult. So I don't recommend cutting too short. It's not good, I think. Okay. Also, this is another cases. Okay, now finish the anastomosis. Okay, looks good, but uh, confirm the bottoms. Okay, you can see the dimples here. Okay, maybe one stitch is inappropriate. Okay, now uh, come flow, good, but maybe occluded near features. Okay, so we should take off uh, this inappropriate sutures and confirm the lumen again. Okay, then suture again. Okay, if the only one suture is inappropriate, maybe occluded the uh, bypass near futures. Okay, now finish. Okay, now so, okay, widely expanded. Okay, this is a good bypass. Okay, widely expanded. Okay, 
the difference. You get here is a dimple. Maybe one a suture is inappropriate. Okay, this is a good after the suturing. Okay, all sutures should be performed properly. So this is another case. Okay, my colleague performs this bypass. Okay, maybe retrospectively, uh, this uh, arytenomy is not good. Okay, this end is incomplete. Okay, here is not completely uh, cut. But he started anastomosis. He can confirm the lumen. Good. But he performed the sutures. Okay, now finish the anastomosis. Check ICG. Okay, you can see the good patency now. But after uh, 30 minutes later, okay, this bypass occluded. Okay, so I check the anastomosis. Okay, you can see the oh, platelet embryos, white embryos here inside the lumens. Okay, block again. Take off the sutures. Okay, if take a long time, uh, there is uh, many thrombus inside the lumens. Okay, in that case, uh, we should the sutures okay, take off all sutures. Okay, now comes the back rows. Okay, the cause of the obstruction is uh, these sutures. Okay, this is a um, platelet thrombus. Okay, this is a thrombus. Too much. Okay. It's difficult to wash out. If there's a damage of the intimus, now take off the thrombus completely. Check back row from the both side. Okay, trimming the uh, walls. Okay, take off the uh, damaged walls. Okay, 
again trimming of the STAs. Okay, now uh, make anastomosis. Okay, confirm the lumens. Okay, then bite the recipient. We confirm the lumens and the bite recipient. We control lateral side. We now finish the anastomosis. Okay, now it's widely expanded. Okay, now come back to the good flow of the bypass. Okay. Okay, so um, make an asmos, we should confirm the inside the lumen and bite. Okay. Last case is a dissection of recipient arteries. This is not the virgin cases. We select the recipient here. Okay, now put the temporary clip. We make arteriotomies. Okay, you can see, but the true lumen is not open. Okay, this is a intima. So make a dissection here. Now open the two lumens. Okay, this is in tumor. Good. Here is a dissection. Okay, how to recover these situations? Okay, firstly, repair the dissection by suturing using 11 zero nylon sutures. This is the intima. We can repair the dissection by suturing. Okay. Around uh, six or seven stitch, one side. It then performs anastomosis.
So this is the final view. Now check the ICG. Okay, you can see the good flow of the graph. Okay, how to recover the dissection of the recipient artery? Okay, firstly, uh, perform the suture and repair the dissection and bite the total layer from the inside. Okay, the, this suture um, recipient, a donor to recipient, never bite this direction. It is important. Okay, conclusions. For the success of bypass surgery, we should run many tips and the troubleshooting techniques. Okay, keeping in mind avoiding trouble is more important. Okay, complete preparation is the key to success of bypass surgery. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Takizawa. It was a great pleasure to listen to your presentation and to, to uh, discover the different uh, tips that you recommend to all our listeners. Um, I have the great pleasure of having read a few papers of you, and I know that you are a very specialist of anastomosis in, uh, on every arteries especially in a paper published uh, in a Tokyo journal about giant middle cerebral artery aneurysm, where you perform multiple bypass. It was, uh, it was very impressive. I have one question and I will uh, give the floor to everyone else. My question is, when do you decide to perform an interrupted or uninterrupted uh, suture? Do you perform sometimes uninterrupted suture? Oh, I decided the uh, uh, suture uh, te techniques uh, depends on the vessel sizes. Okay, in the small vessels, if perform the uh, running sutures, the office is not so wide. Okay, for so the because in, the, in, in these videos we do not, we don't, we didn't, we don't have seen any uh, running suture. It was always interrupted suture. You prefer interrupted suture? Yes, I prefer. I prefer. Mainly okay, you recommend that. Yeah. Do you have Do you have a comment regarding uh, a saphenous venous graft and radial artery graft? Usually, I use radial artery graft. Radial artery but, graft is the best yeah. for you. Okay, thank you for that. Someone else uh, have a has a question. I think we'll uh, invite our honored guest, Professor Shubin, who is one of the okay. ambassadors. Professor Shubin, any comments from you? Uh, yes, uh, I can also uh, reply to question. Uh, I also prefer to use uh, interrupted suturing because you know you don't worry about the tension between the navel uh, mm -hmm. needles. If you use a running suture, you have to adjust the, uh, the tension, tension uh, between yeah. the navel sutures. And uh, normally, especially in moya moya vessels, the recipient artery, uh, the vessel wall is very thin, maybe only one fourth of the donor artery. So the tension between the navel uh, stitches are very uh, difficult to adjust. And uh, sometimes, uh, if the recipient artery tolerate the uh, high flow, uh, the high pressure donor flow from the STA, it can be expanded uh, immediately. And uh, this time, if uh, it's a running suture, there's some um, risk to have the uh, very wide, uh, uh, very wide uh, leak from the uh, the switch one, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you use uh, interrupted suture, you don't worry about this. Yeah. Okay, Bin, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any comment regarding saphenous venous graft and uh, radial artery graft? Yes, uh, especially in the uh, uh, radial artery, I also prefer to use a radial artery if possible uh, because uh, uh, saphenous vein uh, only is a uh, ICA was a dominant site. Uh, it means the ICA supplied the, the whole hemisphere, uh, the ACA, MCA territory, plus the contralateral ACA territory. So this kind of uh, condition, if you want to replace the, uh, the whole ICA, 
I want to use uh, Safina Spain. Okay, yeah. I have one question. My last question would be to both of you, to Professor Takisawa and to you, Bing. Mm -hmm. uh, what is for you, in your extended experience, the most current complication that you have met performing a bypass? The most current. Mm -hmm. Most. The most frequent. The Very first one, thing. the complication that you have had in your experience must happen. Even if you are very excellent, you have met, you have had, you have experienced complication. What was the most frequent, most current ex complication that you have had? Uh, the most frequent uh, complication happened in the Moya Moya uh, bypass. Uh, normally, it's uh, after the surgery, three or four days. Uh, the you know after the direct bypass uh, the blood flow in the uh, bypass was was increased uh, maybe normally intraoperatively it's around maybe twenty to thirty millimeter per minute but yeah. uh, uh, after seven days it uh, could achieve a peak and normally it can uh, for a uh, one bypass uh, it can achieve uh, around the seventy uh, millimeter per, per, uh, per minute if it's a Double bypass, it can more than uh, 100 millimeter per minute. So this kind of uh, high flow bypass, uh, high flow, uh, 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 high, uh, yes, hyperfusion. Uh, hyper 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 yes, hyperfusion. Yes, hyperfusion. Yes, yeah. hyperfusion. Interesting. Yeah. Hyperfusion a few days after surgery. Are you, yes, Professor yes. Takizawa? Yeah, for me, uh, we don't experience brain ischemic complication, but uh, some cases, uh, uh, skin ischemic complication. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, it's, uh, for me, it's the uh, most- uh, Interesting. Yeah, yeah tolerable, especially okay. in double barrel bypass. Uh -huh. Yes, but um, uh, I, I, uh, my approach to harvest the STA uh, was different with uh, <clears throat> Takizawa. I harvested it from the inner side of the scalp Mm. And uh, we'll fix uh, 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 circles from inner side mm. of the scalp. Mm. So it's uh, very few to happen the ischemic of the scalp. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, both of you. I think that uh, I see the, the word to the ASEAN committee, to the ASEAN president, CNS president. Uh, well, I think uh, we can continue discussion after the second topic. Uh, okay. I kindly invite the second speaker. Professor A. Long. I'm very interested to that lecture because I have to perform this Monday a C1, C2 uh, posterior fusion uh, on an old lady with a fracture of C2. So, Professor A. Long, I'm very listening a lot to your lecture. All right. Uh... Thank you, President, uh, for introduction. It's my great honor to be here to join the ACS webinar conference. My topic is uh, current status of the Lantox cell dislocation surgery. Okay, I would like to start my presentation with a little bit uh, review on the history. Uh, as we all know, the the Atlanta dislocation surgery has passed uh, about eight years. There's uh, many female surgery, such as Gally, uh, Magro, etc. In 1980s, uh, Dr. Manitz and his colleagues um, reported their experience on the central line decompression of dentatoyectomy and he elucidated the etiology and usability of the dislocation, direction and mechanics of the compression of intra approach for uh, central eye uh, decompression. It's a long time ago.
At that time, the evaluation index is a focus on the special geometric relationship of dental and then toy process. It's quite different from now uh, current study focus. We we now used to we we focus on the facet joint, but that time is the central uh, central line uh, structure uh, or dental process. So when we enter the, the new medium, uh, we we also noticed the change to happen, including two aspects. One is uh, uh, surgical straight edge. By now, it's a posterior onion surgery dominate. That means most uh, uh, surgeons use uh, posterior surgery, only posterior surgery instead of the combined surgery. The second one is uh, evaluation tools. We focus not only the odontoid process, the central line structure, but also the facet joint and cervical alignment. Uh, when we consider the street edge, uh, we should know it's actually, it's uh, some kind of the indirect decompression rather than direct uh, resection, just like uh, we do in the lumbar surgery, uh, such as olive or lateral uh, Interbar, uh, vertebral uh, uh, fusion. And it's a process to restore the cranial cervical alignment. You should know alignment is equal to decompression. Uh, we, I would like to start uh, Professor Wang, uh, Beijing, uh, from Beijing, China. He reported their serious study in 2000 with uh, combined surgery, he emphasized uh, several uh, following points to be very important. So the first one is uh, uh, Kyver's angle, uh, range from 140 to 160 uh, post-operative. However, it's, if you consider the, uh, the uh, situation of platbasia, it's not exactly correct. Yes. It's not uh, correct. Uh, so I would like to talk it a little bit later. Another important message is uh, cranial cervical joint uh, has a very strong relationship with the lower cervical spine. The third one is uh, anterior opening of the facet joint after operation. That's very important as we I showed in the picture, the red line. The force is a cross point is inside the facet joint. That's really important because that means, uh, according to my research, it's uh, the, the cross point is located at, at about uh, posterior one third of the facet joint. That means before this point, the facet joint is, is uh, in an open or a distracted shape. After this, behind this uh, point, it's compressed or closed. Uh, another, uh, next one is, uh, he is a uh, special screw and plate system is have much power than that we use the screw rod system. And he emphasized the uh, transoral release <clears throat> is, uh, uh, plays a crucial role in the combined surgery. This is his uh, surgical straight edge. He used the uh, traction to a differential diagnosis of the reducible or irreducible dislocation and transoral release is important for the release of the facet joint. The next one is 2004 Gore from India. Uh, as we all know, uh, he first introduced the concept of intra-articular spacer in irreducible dislocation reduction. And he also emphasized the important role of the facet joint. 
In 2011, another Indian doctor, Saluk, uh, he introduced, um, uh, he, he almost uh, the first one to uh, quantitative describe the facet joint use uh, uh, inferior uh, surgical facet angle to declare the orientation of facet uh, determine irreducibility in uh, atlanta toxil dislocation. And he showed us the ISF list 150 uh, implied the irreducible dislocation. Again, select professor in the same year, he show us uh, his uh, strategy with size of large than 150, using intra-articular spacer, less than 150 drill of the facet joint. Uh, the same year, another a doctor from India, Dr. Uh, Chandra, used another uh, index called the surgical joint inclination to declare the uh, high inclination of the facet joint. And his uh, strategy is also posterior only surgery uh, named uh, DCR, uh, destruction, compression, and extension and reduction. Uh, two years later, he expanded his uh, strategy with EAD and GRM. Uh, for the high inclination patient. So his strategy include SJI least 100 DCR, between 100 160 DCR uh, plus GRM, SJI uh, larger than 160 uh, DCR, GRM, and EAD. I would like to talk about EAD and GRM related risk. It's very interesting. In 2010, uh, Dr. Jin from China, uh, he, he, he published his uh, research uh, named the Direct Posterior Reduction and Fixation. Uh, but the most interesting, uh, interesting part is um, there's a, a debate in his, uh, the, the surgery. Uh, as we as you can see, the red circle, there's a destruction in the uh, in his method. However, the destruction will cause it's controversial. It's uh, the reduction, uh, the destruction will cause the uh, uh, cranial joint. Uh, uh, lodosis and the uh, uh, lower cervical spine uh, hyperlodosis uh, station. So it's where it causes uh, uh, dysphagia and uh, respiratory tract uh, obstruction after operation. So it's uh, it, it it's controversial, and I personally think it's. Uh, it, uh, it's a wrong uh, manipulation. This is his uh, treatment algorithm. He emphasized uh, the concept of uh, reducible and irreducible uh, dislocation is less important than uh, before. And the uh, intraoperative traction is unnecessary because uh, posterior ionic surgery has much power uh, for the reduction. And 2010, Dr. Yin from Guangzhou, China, he, he reported their experience on the anterior ionic uh, surgery in top, named top surgery. Uh, 2019, uh, Dr. Petkar, uh, report their uh, studies in your spine uh, named the wedge technique. That is anterior spine implantation and reduction. So what's the uh, risk? 
surgical risk. As the first one always be the vertebral artery. Uh, if you, uh, if the vertebral artery is uh, in an animal station, you will cause, maybe you put the spicer in the facet joint, you cause the uh, facet joint collapse and leading to the obstruction of vertebrae. And it's uh, caused severe complication. Another one, <clears throat> joint remodeling. Joint remodeling is quite technique demanding. It's uh, really, uh, uh, you need some skills to do that. Okay, here is an example. You can see clear is uh, remodeling, uh, a drilling uh, tract here. You can see in the CT scan, post-operative, it clear uh, a drilling tract in the facet joint, superior facet surface of the low part. This is another one, 57 years old male, SGI uh, 162 degrees is high inclination. So you can see there's a clear uh, drilling uh, tract in the superior surface uh, of the facet joint. Uh, my experience to do the uh, joint remodeling you should know the exactly uh, position of the artery, not only, not uh, vertebral uh, artery, but also the internal carotid artery. Another risk, uh, EAD, extra articular destruction. There is a, a paradox called spacer obstruction. For patient with a high neck inclination, some, uh, sometimes you can't, it's impossible to put a spacer in the uh, facet joint. So maybe you put the spacer outside the uh, facet joints, your only choice. However, if you put the spacer outside the uh, facet joint, you will get a paradox phenomenon. That's called use the same height insufficient, same angulation. It's impossible to reduction. Least height or angulation, it's improper cervical lordosis. Same height and same angulation. It's a vertical dislocation. It's a really embarrassment. How to make a choice? As, um, by now you have, you can do combined surgery, intraoperation uh, traction and transoral release and posterior fixation. So you show this picture and you can choose posterior only surgery, DECR, if it's a high inclination facet joint. But you should know the, the uh, EAD or GRM is quite uh, technique demanding and you should pay attention to the vertebral artery. Well, some patient with a uh, comastic uh, uh, demanding, you can choose transoral facet joint release and put the spencer anteriorly into the facet joint. So in general speaking, anterior posterior surgery, combined surgery is suitable for the reducible tenant disc location with high inclination facet joint or reversion surgery or high riding vertebral artery. Posterior surgery is suitable all kinds of the uh, dislocation, no matter uh, or, SGI uh, less than 100 or uh, uh, larger than 160, it's okay. But you should know uh, the, the uh, technique is demanding. So you, 
Uh, it's uh, sometimes depend on the experience of the surgeon. Anterior <clears throat> only surgery. It's a, you should know that it's a minimal invasive. Cosmetic uh, demanding patient, you can choose this one. And odontoid acne, it's only used in bone infusion, reversion surgery, or blood base here within vaccination. Cervical alignment and facet joint. Facet joint is uh, the current uh, hot point in the current academic study. We emphasize on morphology of the C12 facet joint and the cervical alignment. We do a, a variation of facet joint in three dimensional style. We use ICF, ISF, or SGI, CCT to, to, to clear, to carefully evaluate the facet in every detail to make sure how much we, I need to correct it. And most important thing, it's a cervical alignment, just as I mentioned just before. Uh, it's a, a cranial a junction. It's uh, highly correct with uh, C27, it's a lower cervical spine. So we use OCC2, uh, it's a 10 to 20 degrees to, to judge the, the result of the uh, reduction. Is it okay or not? Uh, is uh, satisfactory or unsatisfactory in the operation? Again, important caution, any destructure maneuver behind is the facet joint where led to uh, typhosis upper cervical alignment and consequently result hyperlidosis subaxial cervical spine. It's very important. Don't do any destruction action behind the facet joint. Another important axial tilt Accentute is one part of the uh, cervical uh, spine. We can, uh, uh, we can adjust it. You know, uh, CAA is a very important in index. It includes Cliver's tilt and the Accentute. Cliver's tilt, that's a reference to the uh, future of the cranial base. It's a constant, you can't change it. Uh, what we can do is to change the execute during re reduction. So we just need to uh, uh, adjust it, the uh, execute to its normal value. That's okay. So 90 degrees, a range from 85 to 95, that's okay. So we use these uh, variation tools. You can make a pre-operation uh, plan or a variation. Um, it's a, just a, a mathematic problem. Uh, and uh, you can do intra-operation. Okay. You, uh, and poster operation evaluation, you know which one is suitable reduction, which one is over reduction, and which one is improper reduction. It's wrong. Something wrong with, with your reduction maneuvers. Okay. So I would like to make a conclusion. In the last two decades, revolution certainly occurred in uh, Atlanta uh, dislocation surgery. Emphasize focus on morphology of the facet joint and cervical alignment. Uh, Three-dimensional evaluation of the dislocation became a standard manipulation. post alignment surgery becomes a popular and effective method. Focus on uh, dislocation with high joint Incarnation. This is uh, a current hot point of research. 
whether we use a GD, uh, G, GRM or, or the EAD, or you choose to use a combined surgery, which one you choose. So it's largely depend on the uh, doctor's ex uh, personal experience, uh, instrument uh, require, or even more important, uh, the team, team cooperation. Vertebral artery injury is uh, still a major surgical risk in uh, posterior surgery. Future research concentrated on MIS manipulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Mr. Sarastopoulos. You're muted, Professor. Please unmute yourself. Voila. Thank you to Professor Helong for this presentation. My first question is to know uh, what is his experience using preoperative traction to prepare for surgery. Does he has a comment regarding using preoperative traction to prepare the patient for the surgery? Actually, we don't use uh, preoperation uh, traction. Uh, in the uh, operation, we use uh, a limb, uh, just a little the cranial traction. Yeah. To, uh, intra operation traction used uh, uh, as a diagnosis tool. Okay. Nowadays, but now okay. we use uh, posterior only surgery. So the, the, the attraction just a uh, 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 massive. Okay. You don't need to diagnose it. Redu reducible or irreducible? Yeah. Okay. My second question is regarding using neuro navigation when you want to place C1 uh, screw and C2 screws. What do you think of using navigation, neuro navigation to prepare, to help you to, to define the trajectory of your screws? Navigation we used uh, in the uh, uh, at the beginning of my work. Sometimes a uh, young neurosurgeon user, uh, I usually don't use the navigation because you before the operation you see the 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 CT scan you make a plan on it and in the operation. You just uh, track the, the the it's a map in your mind. You you can show you. I don't it mind. Is, it is, okay, it, it is wonderful. Uh, although my last question would be: You see the problem. You have you have very well and stressed that problem is the vertebral artery risk of injury. Do you could you? Tell us a few words of what has happened when you have met in your experience a vertebral artery injury. For example, the last time that you had had a vertebral artery injury, what did you do during surgery to control the situation? Uh, it's, uh, I, I totally have three patients uh, vertebral artery injury. One is that uh, two two patients died. In two patients died. Yes, two patients died three years ago. Uh, it's uh, it, so I I just uh, if if I now I I I would not do that again. I will yeah. choose combined surgery, not yeah. post running surgery. I will carefully evaluate to the patient with a CT scan. Okay, and when you say CT scan, do you mean also an angio CT scan to see the carotid artery and the vertebral artery, I suppose? Uh, both where we were checking the, I, I, oh. I just see in the slide, uh, we were uh, examine the uh, vertebral artery 
and uh, carotid artery because we do the posterior, uh, from posterior to do the uh, GRM, just like an uh, osteotomy in the deformity uh, surgery. We, we okay. cut the joint. So we no. Still one question regarding the C2 occipital distraction. Uh, is it possible all the time when you decide to perform a C2, C0, C2 occipital distraction to reach the distraction that you wanted? Or have you observed sometimes that you didn't reach the distraction that you have planned before surgery? Any action like a distraction, we were not use the uh, destruction in the operation behind uh -huh. the passive joint. Okay. We were not, we just uh, compress the plate or the, or the rod to the uh, occipital bone. Okay. No destruction. Okay. Okay. Thank you on my behalf. I have no more question and I thank you again for your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Atkapalos. In that case, we will invite our honored guest, Professor Atul Goel, who is one of the legends in C0, C1, C2 fixation. Professor Goel. Yeah, thank you, Raja, for inviting me to give my comments. <clears throat> See, atlantoaxial joint is the most mobile joint of the body, most mobile. And atlantoaxial instability is the most common spinal instability in the body. My, I am absolutely convinced that atlantoaxial instability is an under-recognized and under-treated clinical entity because there are many atlantoaxial instabilities that we do not recognize. And what we need to do is we have to recognize these instabilities. There can be atlantoaxial instability associated with OPLL. There can be atlantoaxial instability associated with degenerative spine. There can be atlantoaxial instability associated with Hirayama disease. There can be atlantoaxial instability only in the presence of clipple file abnormality. So atlantoaxial instability is common and under-recognized. Most important is that it is now time for all neurosurgeons not to ignore atlantoaxial joint, not to ignore the techniques of atlantoaxial stabilization. And there is no question that we have to learn atlantoaxial stabilization. My technique of atlantoaxial stabilization involves three steps. One is open the articulation, open the facetal articulation. That is number one. Second step is denude the articular cartilage. That is number two step. Number three step is introduce bone graft inside the facetal articulation. And then you have to do stabilization. So over the years, I'm doing this kind of stabilization. There are two or three steps, which I think that are important for me to let you know. One is that over the years, I have completely abandoned transoral decompression. And I'm absolutely convinced that transoral decompression or transoral release is not a viable option or a good option in my opinion. Second thing I have completely abandoned is to do occipital C0 fixation. I never include the occipital bone in the fixation construct even in situations of assimilated atlas, when there is assimilation of atlas, it does not mean that you can use occipital bone as fixation construct. When occipital screws were first described by me long time ago, in more before 1987, atlantoaxial joint opening can be difficult and dangerous, and we have to know the anatomy of the vertebral artery in relationship to the C2 absolutely precisely. And there are methods to do C2 screw fixation, even in cases of high riding vertebral artery, even in situations when the vertebral artery is quite medially located, we can still do C2 vertebral 
uh, C2 pedicle screw fixation. In short, atlantoaxial fixation is a fantastic surgery and atlantoaxial joint stabilization can give instantly new life to the people, new life. On the other hand, if you do not know how to do atlantoaxial stabilization and you create a complication, it can be a devastating complication. The other thing which I would like to just mention in passing is that now recently you might have heard of my work on Chiari formation. Chiari formation, syringomyelia, and various other kinds of abnormalities are natural protective maneuvering and they indicate the presence of atlantoaxial instability and atlantoaxial stabilization is the treatment. So the next step, which I completely have abandoned in the list of my surgical procedures is foramen magnum decompression surgery. I have completely abandoned for several years in my department. So those are few issues which I have to raise. The other thing which Christian has asked about uh, pre-operative traction. I do not give pre-operative traction. I give intra-operative traction. Other thing that he asked about navigation, I used to do navigation and there is no harm in doing navigation if you have navigation ready. You must use if you have and particularly as our speaker was saying that early on in your experience when you are doing few cases, you know, you have just started, you have done not many cases, you're not absolutely conversant, then navigation is a very important tool. But, you know, when, uh, when you have more and more experience, you can avoid not only navigation, but also fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy, even fluoroscopy is not essential in doing these kind of operations. The other thing is, which is very crucial that Christian asked was when vertebral artery gets injured, then what? You see, I have, I have got the world's largest experience in damaging the vertebral artery. I have damaged several vertebral arteries during my journey for last 30 years or more, maybe 32 or 33 years. I did my first case of C1, C2 fixation in the year 1987. Since then, I have done over 3,000, nearing 3,000 cases of C1, C2 fixation. And during this journey, I have damaged vertebral artery on several occasions. And one message I have to give you is, if you have damaged, it does not mean the patient will not come out and patient will die. You don't have to really get scared in that situation if you have sacrificed the vertebral artery particularly in the young people. Of course, you have to avoid vertebral artery damage. Of course, you should not damage the vertebral artery. But if you have damaged the vertebral artery, that does not mean the patient will not get up or patient will not survive. I have damaged for your information, both sides vertebral artery also on occasions without any issues. But the most important thing is when you have damaged the vertebral artery, there is so much bleeding in that situation Anastomosis, direct anastomosis has to be done if the damage to the vertebral artery is lateral to the articulation. If the, if the damage is, if you have done C2 screw fixation and the blood comes out because of the vertebral artery damage, then the only step that is possible for you is quickly take the screw and complete your screwing procedure. Then don't uh, have to identify the site of uh, damage and laceration and try to suture it. At that time, when it is damaged at the site of C2 screw insertion, the best thing is to sacrifice the vertebral artery quickly rather than letting the blood flow from the head and from the uh, caudal side and the rostral side at the same time. And that can be a very dangerous procedure. I think uh, learning the anatomy of vertebral artery, identifying the location of the vertebral artery, having the possibility of mobilizing the vertebral artery from the high riding vertebral artery groove is also a big possibility. You can drill the posterior surface of the C2 pedicle, isolate the vertebral artery and mobilize the vertebral artery to introduce the C2 screw. That is also a very effective surgical procedure. So there are ways to handle the vertebral artery. Vertebral artery is difficult and dangerous in its location. 
but that difficulty, the whole operation is difficult. It is not just the vertebral artery. There are so many issues which are difficult, but we should aim to do C1, C2 fixation. There is no way to compromise and include occipital bone. There is no way you can do subaxial fixation like inclusion of C3, C4. Those make the construct completely unstable and you know the stability is not there. You should always introduce bone graft in the region. You should always remove the C2 muscles, spinous process muscles very elaborately. You have to make the host bone very suitable for getting the bone graft. And I always use bone graft from the iliac crest. So these are a few issues related to my journey with atlanto axial fixation. Thank yeah. you. Yes, we sir. can say that uh, it was an incredible long and very intense uh, journey. Thank you for sharing with us your experience. It was wonderful to listen to you again. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to listen to Professor Goel and his novel ideas. We're looking forward for many other ideas coming soon. Uh, <laughs> I would like to invite other my uh, colleagues for this discussion. Here's yes, my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Singh. Thank you, uh, Rajan. Uh, thank you, Professor Feng, for a very nice presentation. I have uh, two questions for Professor. Uh, one is the term used, uh, joint remodeling uh, for the correction, uh, which I find it probably is a misnomer because uh, once you disrupt the articular uh, uh, surface of the joint for remodeling, it should actually lead to fusion and there should not have any more joint. Uh, what is your comment about this? A uh, second question is, uh, when you want, you show us the different way to correct the angle between trivers C1 and C2, uh, but uh, in most of the time, especially those involved the cranus vital fusion posteriorly, we always need to look at the visual exists. And it's never been discussed in most textbook. Uh, uh, we never considered that only on table, we, we try to make sure the, the visual axis because the, the correction of visual axis is very important to avoid failure of the fusion and probably worsening uh, or, or correction of the swiker lordosis. Uh, may I know your opinion, Professor? Okay, the first one you asked, uh, it's a uh, uh, joint remodeling. It's a, uh, Something you should pay attention to. First one is uh, the artery. One is a vertebral artery, another one is a, a carotid artery. You should uh, make a clear uh, uh, where they come from and the, the distance uh, between the vertebral artery and the uh, facet surface. And the posterior lip of the inferior facet joint, you, you can. Uh, keep more superior uh, facet joint, uh, the inferior lip, you can you can drill more. So it makes the tractor parallel. So you can put in the, uh, the cage. But the important thing is uh, the vertebral artery. If it's a high riding, you should be very, very careful. If you put the, uh, the cage in that case, it, it's uh, uh, most uh, uh, possible to cause uh, we call facet uh, collapse. Uh, we, my colleagues, have a one case is this situation: collapse and obstruction of the vertebral artery. So uh, I don't know this. It's, uh, it's your answer. The second why I I don't make sure I understand. What's your second question? Yeah, uh, when you discuss about the correction uh, between the cranus vital uh, axis uh, from the clivus to C1 and C2, uh, especially when you plan to do a posterior fusion, cranus vital uh, fusion, uh, never, I never heard about discussion regarding the visual axis, uh, whether that should be part of your planning, uh, because we want the patient to able to look straight forward uh, after the fusion. So may I know your opinion regarding this? Excuse me, uh, he's asking about visual axis. Visual axis, patient has to look straight. Yeah. Straight away in front of him. <laughs> so, so Goel can answer it, I think. Yeah, the, you know what, uh, Dr. Liu, your first question was the most fantastic question. First question you said about joint remodeling. You see what you said was 
we have to achieve, you know, to drill the joint and to make it weaker is make, makes the whole procedure, you know, what you have to do is open the joint and introduce and distract and introduce bone graft rather than drilling the joint itself. The facetal mm -hmm. articulation itself is not at all. You know, my feeling is you don't drill the facet, why you have to drill the facetal articulation? The question is to open the joint is a little tricky operation, particularly in cases where there is assimilation of atlas, when there is basilar invagination, when the clivus is small, to open the articulation is difficult. But if you open the articulation and introduce bone graft, and that's the end of the story. Other thing which I want to tell you, and which is an absolutely important thing is, you see, you do distraction, you introduce spacers and all those things are okay. But what is more important is, and this is very important sentence, you just remember this sentence, more than realignment, more than cranio, as you also mentioned, more than cranio vertebral junction realignment, it is the firm stabilization which is important. And solid stabilization is more important than any kind of realignment. Essentially, what we do is instability is the problem and stabilization is the treatment. Decompression, I, as I mentioned, anterior decompression and posterior decompression are, were done. You see, they were done when the anomaly was not understood, where the thing was considered to be fixed. When the region is fixed, you do decompression. When the region is unstable, you do stabilization. Did you get what my point is, Liu? Yeah, yes, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. For joining, uh, we have any other questions are welcome. The minimal, I'll just touch it sensei. I hope he's here. Sensei. And I will ask one question to Professor Takizawa, uh, Raja. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, Professor, yeah, Professor, I want to ask you, uh, yeah, regarding, uh, regarding the bypass, uh, when we prepare the donor site, uh, we do the fish mouth to have a bigger uh, bypass, uh, and then uh, there will be a longer end of the donor and shorter end. May I know that, uh, do we consider uh, the direction of flow of the recipient uh, before we, we decide that whether the longer end of the donor we go to the proximal or more distal end of the recipient uh, for a flow direction because I think Professor Zubin has many lectures talk about the flow direction in his, in his bypass surgery. Thank you, Professor. Uh, um, it is uh, difficult to decide the directions. Uh, it depends on the situations. Firstly, and check the ICG before uh, anastomosis. And usually, uh, if performed the double barrel bypass, one bypass in direction to the uh, distal side, and another one is the proximal side. So uh, I decided to case by case it. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Another question that I would just like to. Uh, Dr. Liu, my, yeah. uh, my opinion is uh, that. Uh, I will, uh, if you use a double bypass, normally I will use uh, uh, one in the uh, superior trunk and the, the another one in the inferior trunk. And uh, the, before the uh, surgery, you, you should analyze the uh, pressure gradient of the uh, recipient MCA network. So sometimes if, if it's uh, still keep the physiological direction, the proximal uh, pressure is larger than the distal. So you should point the donor artery to the distal side, otherwise reverse side, yeah. Thank you, Professor. Because the MCA territory have two types of the pressure gradient. Right, thank you very much, Professor Shubin. That was very interesting answer. And Raja, I have a yes, good news to, to you. One Today, day. there's around 3,000 audience. <laughs> wow, that's great. A huge number, yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Zubin. Yes, Professor Dr. Perlis, your concluding remarks. 
Well, it was a great honor and uh, essentially a great pleasure to be with my colleague from the ASEAN world. It's, um, uh, you know that I like a lot your culture and your, and your contribution to the neurosurgical science. Uh, I'm very happy to see again my friend Bing Su. I hope that I will have the opportunity in the future to meet you again in a real Congress and not a virtual one and to share with you a sake of something else. And uh, again, I would like to, uh, to, to thank you, the coordinator, and also Professor Takizawa and Professor Eilong for their very nice lecture. And I wish you the best, and I wish you my best wishes for 2021. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor. Thank you so much. So in that case, we will close thank this up. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers for today, Professor Katsumi Takizawa, as well as Professor Feng Hailong for coming to this webinar and teaching us elaborately about their subspecialities. Thank you very much, my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Seng, for joining. We are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin. Thank you, Professor Atul Goel, for coming here and giving your expert comments. So until next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you.